Let's get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Lillian Maron and I'm the Director of Outreach and Education at End of Life Choices New York. Thank you for joining us for today's discussion on palliative care and COVID-19. Before turning it over to our speaker, I'd like to tell you about my organization and go over some logistics. End of Life Choices New York is a nonprofit and the leading organization in New York working to improve end of life care and expand end of life options to ensure peaceful death. We do this by pursuing legal and legislative reform to expand end of life options and ensure a patient's right to a peaceful death. By, advocate, by educating the public and healthcare professionals on end of life issues, and also by providing free counseling and support to people who are preparing advanced directives, caring for a terminally ill loved one, or who are approaching the end of life themselves. For more information about our organization, please visit endoflifechoicesny.org. And don't worry, I will mention that again at the end. After the talk, there will be time to answer your questions. To ask a question, just type it into the Q&A box at any time. So without further ado, I will introduce our speaker, Dr. Dana Lesvader. Dr. Lesvader is chief of the Department of Palliative Care for Optum's ProHealth, a large multi-specialty provider group serving 1.5 million people in the New York metropolitan area. She developed patient and family-centered high-value healthcare models in the home and via telemedicine through her roles as senior medical advisor for Aspire Health and is the founder and CMO of Optum Supportive Care. Prior to this, Dr. Lesvader worked as a critical care physician at Northwell Health, where she served as the ICU director, founder and section head of palliative medicine and program director for the Palliative Medical Fellowship. During the COVID-19 pandemic, she worked, she returned to work as an intensivist in the overwhelmed New York City hospitals. She's a professor of medicine at Northwell Hofstra School of Medicine. Dr. Lesbader is a faculty member for the Center to Advance Palliative Care and an elected board member for the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. She earned her medical degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Medicine completed internal medicine training at New York University Medical Center and critical care medicine fellowship at St. Vincent's Hospital. Dr. Lesbader is triple board certified in palliative care, internal medicine, and critical care medicine. We are thrilled to have her join us today for this important discussion on palliative care and COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Lesbader, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Lillian, and it's so good to be here. Um, and I'm going to do a brief a presentation and then uh, open, open the floor up for conversation. Uh, um, I'm going to just start um, and talk a little bit about what it's been like here in New York um, and how palliative care has uh, intertwined uh, with uh, COVID-19 on the front lines, both in the hospital setting and then also I'll speak a little bit about some of the changes we're seeing in palliative care uh, in the outpatient setting as well. Um, so, as Lillian mentioned, I, I work at ProHealth, which is an Optum company, and we're a large physician group, um, and ProHealth was initially uh, treating athletes and then really became very uh, comprehensive and over the past 20 years has developed a pretty robust palliative care program where we serve oncology patients, terminally ill patients, we have a pain clinic, um, and we do a lot of telemedicine. We've been doing telepalliative care now for five years. Around early April, uh, the mayor issued a call for anyone with uh, medical skills to please help on the front lines of COVID. And as a former critical care physician um, and still active in critical care and really uh, involved in that for 20 years, I returned to the front lines and went back as a critical care physician serving patients mostly in Queens hospitals uh, in the really overwhelmed COVID ICUs. And, brought with me my palliative care skills, but also helped to really treat the over 50,000 patients that were seen throughout the Northwell Health System that had COVID and uh, many, many thousands in each of the uh, 23 hospitals that the health system operated. Um, and so I want to share with you a little bit about how we thought about COVID and especially some of the end of life issues that uh, came up. Um, this was a documentary on 60 Minutes, looking at what was happening in some of our hospitals. Um, and what you can see here is just, you know, I want you to just to appreciate how difficult it is to even go into a patient's room with the donning uh, or putting on of the masks, the goggles, the face shield, the hairnet, the uh, robe, 
the gloves, and, and really everything being put on for each and every patient's room that you go into uh, to do any kind of procedure. And what we now know about COVID-19 is that not only does it spread by droplets, but it is aerosolized. And so it can really fill an entire room, especially when you're doing procedures like here, putting in a breathing tube or uh, bronchoscopy or other things that we frequently do in the ICU. I'm also gonna talk a little bit about uh, the workforce issues that we saw. Um, and we were blessed to have people come and help us in New York from other states, people from Tennessee, Texas, Utah came to help early on in April and May uh, and June to really help us at the very beginning, even in March actually uh, of the pandemic. And then I'll touch on some uh, telemedicine. So this is what things look like in early April, um, where everything was really just happening mostly in Queens and the New York City area, uh, a little bit outside of that, but really a, the epicenter of the epicenter uh, was here. And so really learning how to do things on the fly. And one of the things that was most striking, uh, which was so reminiscent of being like at war and on a battlefield where you're just making these decisions right in the moment was every week, there'd be sort of a new recipe for what we should use to treat COVID-19. So do we anticoagulate? Do we use steroids? Do we use drugs that suppress the immune system? Uh, are steroids good or bad? Is aspirin good or bad? What about ACE inhibitors? Uh, hydroxychloroquine, rem remdesivir, you know, all of these things we were early on. Some people got them. We had a big cocktail of stuff. And then we said, you know, maybe, maybe less is more. Let's do what we know and uh, do good critical care and then only add things after we've, you know, done some of the studies and, and learned what might work and what might not. Um, so really being at the forefront, uh, at least in the United States, to start to learn and test what was working and what wasn't. We also started to recognize some of the very serious complications. This is a weird virus. Um, not only is it a respiratory virus, and you can see this sort of reticular, this sort of symmetric pattern on the x-ray, you just sort of see all of these little tiny lines on both sides. This should be clear black on a chest x-ray. And you just see these wispy uh, ground glass, we call it, but wispy, reticular, linear, thread-like lines so that this is not pure black. This is kind of messy looking and it's symmetric and it's everywhere. So we're finding this sort of a lung involvement. This is a dialysis machine. A lot of patients ended up having kidney injury and many requiring dialysis. The mortality rate for people who go on a ventilator and a dialysis machine was extremely high. And early on, we were seeing mortality rates of over 80% in patients in the ICU who, go, who went on a breathing machine. That number came down a bit over time, but still the mortality rate is close to 50% or so uh, for patients who do have breathing that is so compromised that they go on a breathing machine. Thromboembolic disease or blood clotting disease, you can see these purple toes here. One of the things we were seeing, seeing is people coming in with purple toes or a blood clot in their leg, and that would be their presenting symptom of COVID. Um, and so these COVID toes became really quite worrisome and we would always look for those on people, especially young people who would just present with that alone. Um, there are a number of prolonged complications too that we are seeing with COVID-19 now, where people months and months and months later are feeling depressed, tired, short of breath. There's prolonged lung injury that can happen. Uh, people have a loss of smell. Um, my own daughter, uh, who's 16, uh, lost her sense of smell back in uh, early April, um, and it turns out she had COVID um, and still can't smell. And so really this prolonged sense of uh, loss of smell, really very disturbing for many patients because uh, also dangerous because you can't smell you know, if something's on fire or something like that. So very interesting and prolonged symptoms related to COVID infection. One of the things regarding end of life that was very important was how do we know who's dying and what kinds of things can we look for in patients with COVID so that we can help prognosticate better who is really at risk for dying and how do we make sure that we're accurately prognosticating so that we can make appropriate medical decisions for patients. Um, remember in the hospitals, there were no visitors. So we had nobody visiting in the hospitals. Patients were alone. There were no visitors pretty much at all. Uh, we did a lot of telemedicine virtual visits, but we just couldn't risk exposing 
family members and loved ones to COVID patients were not in what we would call negative pressure rooms where they were uh, sort of safe, but you could even walk through the halls or a COVID open unit and the virus would be everywhere. And so unless you're properly gloved and, and have a special uh, N95 mask that's been properly fitted and it's retested every single year, it's just too dangerous for families. And so we really had to limit that. One of the things we looked at were blood tests. So there are certain inflammatory markers in the blood we were able to look at. We also learned that people who had cardiac disease or diabetes or obesity were also at very high risk for dying. Anybody also with a serious illness like end-stage renal disease or cancer uh, or baseline frailty and cachexia, um, like nursing home patients, had a much higher mortality rate. And half the deaths in New York and New Jersey, or nearly half, uh, were nursing home patients, really vulnerable populations who had very severe um, frailty and, and poor reserve. And so this virus being so aggressive in that population uh, made us worry a great deal about the vulnerable population from nursing homes. Once people go into the ICU post-intubation, usually they'll go into an ICU only after being put on a ventilator for the most part, we looked at all their other comorbidities. We also looked at how well or how poorly they were oxygenating. How good was their oxygen level on a life support machine, a breathing machine? We were also able to measure how stretchy or how stiff the lungs were. And the more stiff the lungs were, the worse they would do. And in fact, what we later learned was that when we did CAT scans on people with COVID, some of their lungs looked like very end stage lung disease, terminal lung disease. And there has now at least been one COVID patient who recovered who actually got a lung transplant for end stage COVID lung disease. So really interesting that COVID-19 causes severe terminal lung injury um, as well as many other things, but really can wreak havoc on, on the lungs in particular. Uh, patients requiring dialysis, also a very bad prognostic sign when people need a ventilator and dialysis. And then anybody whose blood pressure is very low in the ICU, uh, we would worry a great deal about because that would imply that their heart and their blood vessels and their um, body wasn't able to maintain a regular blood pressure, probably from an overactive inflammatory reaction to the COVID virus, but really a very bad prognostic sign when somebody goes into shock from any illness, but especially with COVID. We also worked very hard to manage patients' symptoms. And there were a number of palliative care teams that were helping to manage patients on the floors so that when patients were really short of breath, uh, and one of the things we would try very hard to do was to keep patients off ventilators. We learned that putting them on too fast was not good because the mortality rate was so high once patients would go into an IC on a ventilator. And patients could tolerate a pretty low oxygen level, even below 90%, if we uh, rotated them. And we would call this adult tummy time, where we would put adults on their tummies and rotate them left and right, side to side. And what that did was it actually helped uh, improve the oxygenation and shifted the blood flow throughout the lungs so that we would oxygenate all parts of the lung, gravity pulling everything down. And so by rotating somebody on their back, on their stomach, side to side, we could sort of swish around the blood in the lungs so that more of the lung tissue would participate in gas exchange and we could actually help improve the patient's oxygenation. So having somebody on their left side, as we see here, and then rotating to the tummy, and then on the right side. And this is very hard to do when somebody is extremely short of breath. And so we would facilitate FaceTime and virtual visits with loved ones. You can see a cell phone here where we would facilitate uh, a conversation with the patient's family. We would play music for the patient. We would really try to do other things to improve their quality of life so that we could, if possible, prevent uh, the need to put this patient on a ventilator, a life support machine, because we knew that their chances of survival would be far greater if we could manage them safely uh, by proning them, putting them on their tummies, and giving them oxygen um, and other ways of ventilating them without a, a ventilator. Also, going on a ventilator requires very deep sedation, and so sometimes we'd have to use 
uh, drugs that paralyze patients so that they could tolerate the ventilator. Um, and that is very difficult to do um, uh, on a ventilator. And it's hard for patients to have any meaningful connection once we do that. And so we really wanted to make sure they could still connect to loved ones. Communicating with patients and their families is very difficult, especially in a hospital setting with no visitors. And so we had to get very creative about making sure we had iPads, that we did a lot of virtual visits. We were doing FaceTime, Zoom, Skype, whatever we could with family members so that patients could be connected to their loved ones. Because there was such a shortage of palliative care clinicians, we had to skill up everyone else. And so we promoted medical students to be doctors. We had hospitalists going into the ICU. Um, we really raised everyone's skill level and also wanted to make sure that patients had a basic uh, communication skill, especially regarding um, bad news or serious illness. So we developed a script. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to do was to make sure that when we would call families, we'd say, this is not an emergency, unless it was, but if it wasn't, because right away they see that we're calling from a no-caller ID or a hospital and they get they panic. So we really wanted to make sure they knew that this was not death notification, for example. The second thing we found to be very important was to say, how has COVID or corona impacted you? Because so often what we found, especially during the peak, was that patients had just come from a Zoom funeral or they had just uh, lost their job, or they themselves had just gotten a diagnosis of COVID. And so we really wanted to uh, make sure that this was a good time, that they were in a place they could hear what we were going to talk about, and we also wanted to know what they were going through. We would then ask what the doctors had told them so far, and very often this might be the first call they were getting. They had no idea that their loved one was on a breathing machine in the ICU or that their loved one was in fact dying. Their loved one might have been an otherwise 40 year old who came into the hospital with COVID and then got a pulmonary embolism or a renal failure or got put on a breathing machine and all of that happened very quickly. And maybe they weren't brought up to speed on that because there were just too many things going on and they just weren't uh, uh, called. So we would often wanna know what do they know right now so we would know where to start and then we could build upon what they already know we would always ask permission. May I share uh, an update with you? Is this a good time? And by asking permission, what this does is it gives families a sense of control. They can sort of control the pace of the conversation and we can also make sure that this actually is a good time for them to hear some news, that they're not at work or they're not in the process of themselves losing their job or something else where they're just not paying attention and they're distracted. So really asking permission before we move forward. And then what we would often do if we were doing this by telephone was ask if they would like to see their loved one, and then we would facilitate a virtual visit. Um, I want to just touch on the importance of the healthcare proxy, especially during times of COVID. Um, we relied heavily on the patient's designated medical decision, decision maker. Even if they didn't have a healthcare proxy, we would always ask them who uh, shall we call to help make medical decisions if you can't? If we knew that they had a healthcare proxy, we would use that person. Um, I do want to take this opportunity to just say in all of the patients we took care of, that I took care of hundreds or maybe a thousand COVID patients, um, I never once saw a living will. Um, patients don't have them. We didn't have family members there. There's no place to put them in the electronic health record. There's no receptacle for a living will. They go into the abyss. Um, and so they're really just useless. Uh, what is useful is a healthcare proxy or someone who knows the patient's values so that when we go to that person and say, here's what's going on now, tell me what's important to your mom. Um, here are some uh, options. Here are some things that we can think about. Uh, I just want to make sure this is in keeping with what your mom's wishes are. So really important uh, to have a healthcare proxy that knows what the patient values. But you know, just my own experience, especially during times of COVID, uh, especially with no families around, um, no one has time to read a 10 or 20 page living will. It just really is difficult. But a healthcare proxy that really knows the patient's wishes, and perhaps they might have read a living will, that could be useful. But really, 
we need somebody who knows what the patient's wishes are and we go to that person for medical decision making. The other document that's incredibly useful is the MOLST form, the Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment form. And for our nursing home patients in particular, or anyone with a serious or advanced illness who's got a MOLST completed in New York State, it's pink, in Connecticut it's green. Uh, but these forms are very useful because often it will say, do not resuscitate, do not hospitalize, do not intubate. And when we have that clear order, it's an order, um, we are required, of course, to follow it. It's very, very useful uh, to see what, what that says and to, to follow that. When we send patients back to the nursing home or send them out and they have a serious illness, making sure that they have the MOLST or pulsed form completed so that they are protected from treatments that they do not want and value. So really important if they're leaving the hospital and they're on a ventilator um, and they might have a peg and a trach, but they don't want to have CPR, they don't want dialysis, that we complete the most form. So when they go to the nursing home or long-term care that they're protected from those kinds of things. So the two really important documents in the setting of COVID are the healthcare proxy and for those with serious or advanced illness, the most or the pulsed form. One of the things that we did to try to personalize patients was to create, you know, sort of a little sticky that would go on the patient's door. Some patients were in these private rooms with glass doors. Other patients were in COVID wards where there might be 20 or 30 COVID patients separated by curtains. But what we would try to do is to put something personal over the head of their bed or on the door. What do they like to be called? What do they like? What did their loved ones say about them today? So that when we're talking to them, especially if they're on a breathing machine, we can actually bring up something. We can play music that we know they might like. Uh, I had a patient who loved Frank Sinatra music. So whenever I'd go into his room to visit, I'd always play Frank Sinatra on my own iPhone on Spotify so he could hear Frank Sinatra as I would go in and we would just listen for a moment together a song that he would like. These are some of the rooms where we had sort of wide open spaces. And again, you can see why we couldn't have family members very easily visiting here because the entire room here is aerosolized COVID. And so you can't even be in this room without having all of your gear on and you leave it on the entire day. What we did use a lot in palliative care was the COVID iPads and we would just simply put them in a Ziploc bag and we would bring them over to the patient's bedside and we would connect with patients, family members from all over the world. Um, Queens is very diverse, and so many times our family meetings and uh, uh, connections with family or discussions about what to do next with patients would happen with family members that were all over the world and um, in the U.S. as well. And so really using the uh, COVID iPad to do WhatsApp or FaceTime or Skype or whatever worked for family members was wonderful. And because there were a lot of leniencies, there still are regarding what um, you use, what technology you used, and what software you use, we had a lot of flexibility. So years and years of legal issues were just disappeared and um, even licensure issues disappeared and we were able to practice really good medicine and do really good telemedicine and include families virtually. It was just such a gift for many patients who, for some, it was the last time they saw a family member before they died. Um, so really a very important way to make sure that families could see that everything was being done for their loved one. Uh, and some families did want to pray or play a song or share a story with somebody before they died. And so it was very important we had this ability uh, to do that with families and patients. This was one of these uh, shocking kind of um, things to see where we were running out of places to put people. This is actually a lecture hall in one of the large hospitals in New York City and um, it was converted into a COVID unit um, for uh, 63 patients or so. And it used to see 200 uh, doctors and nurses and learners and it's been a conference room ever since I came there about 30 years ago. Um, and it, everything was just ripped out overnight and it was converted and a sink is being installed up where the podium would be. So just some of these hospitals were just ripped apart to meet the need of COVID patients. Um, and it was really quite remarkable uh, at the leadership of what some of the health systems were able to do. This is Northwell and it was just remarkable leadership to see uh, a unit converted um, overnight uh, to meet the need of patients. And this became a superb COVID unit um, in two days, uh, and it was filled uh, with really good COVID care and people survived because of this. 
um, I was seeing a patient in another room, this is on a medical floor, and I was watching on TV that this US uh, naval ship Comfort was gonna come to New York. And I thought, that's fantastic. We really need help. How wonderful. Um, and sadly, this ship only served 182 patients. I mean, you know, we had 182 patients across two floors that we converted to ICUs. I mean, we just took labor and delivery in the operating rooms and poof, that was for 182 patients. So to have an entire ship that only served a total of that number of patients was really disappointing and, um, you know, really was frustrating on the front lines to see um, things sitting empty uh, when we needed the help so badly. There were also workforce issues. Um, and one of the things that we spent a lot of time talking about was uh, ventilator shortages. And there was a lot of uh, discussion about splitting ventilators and how do we ration them. And we never did that. We never needed to do that. There were plenty of ventilators, thanks to the leadership in New York. But um, what there was a shortage of was skilled, trained critical care doctors and nurses. And that wasn't really talked about. And from an ethical perspective, um, it might be something to discuss going forward because certainly people do better um, if they have a critical care doctor and critical care nurse managing them. And so, you know, do we at some future point start having very hard conversations about triaging patients to superior care and inferior care based on survivability so that the most viable patients go to ICUs and floors that are staffed correctly with ICU doctors and nurses and maybe those that aren't going to survive, no matter what you do, go to places where they're staffed with hospitalists or pediatricians or non-ICU doctors. It, it really is a tough discussion. We've never had that as a country. And um, we talked a lot about the toys, uh, the gizmos, the ventilators, but we didn't really talk about workforce and triaging patients to places where they'd have the best chance of surviving and uh, not such a great chance of surviving, which is really uh, related to who's managing your care. Um, and that's something that's a very hard conversation to have. Uh, one of the things I will never forget was one of the anesthesiologists, it was eight or nine o'clock at night on a Sunday night, and we were both leaving and um, I had to call him over to put a, a woman on a ventilator. I had just done a virtual visit with, she's a single mom, just done a visit with her son, her teenage son, but she just couldn't do it anymore. She was so tired. She I was afraid to leave her overnight. Uh, I thought she wouldn't survive off the ventilator. So I called the anesthesiologist over to put her on the breathing machine and he was actually crying. Uh, and he shared with me that uh, when he would intubate her, put the breathing tube in her, and my eyes are the last ones she'll ever see. And this haunts him every time he puts a breathing tube in. And we walked out to our cars that night together, just kind of debriefing. It was the first time we had really, I had debriefed with anyone about that. Um, and, uh, you know, it really takes a toll on, on people. Um, and we had promoted a lot of very young clinicians, medical students to doctors, some young hospitalists to critical care docs. Um, and I, I really do worry about the toll that this will take on, on folks. We had a lot of labor and delivery nurses, pediatric nurses come in to help who had never seen a patient die before. So a lot of our palliative care staff were really involved in helping uh, people deal with grief and loss. And uh, you get connected to patients and you, you bond with them and then they, they decompensate so very quickly. Um, and so there was a lot of loss um, I think there will be a lot of PTSD, anxiety, and depression uh, in the workforce. So we're seeing that now, and so being mindful of how we manage that. One of the things that we did was celebrate the wins, um, and this is our sort of our happy dance. Um, this is when we would uh, get someone successfully off a ventilator, um, and they would do well. And overhead on the intercom system, uh, uh, here Comes the Sun would be played uh, from the Beatles. So the full song would be played and people would have a moment to celebrate and you would know no matter where you were in the hospital that something wonderful had just happened. Again, we talked a little bit about the resource allocation. This is uh, a cartoon or not a cartoon, it's actually a real model of ventilator splitting where you take one ventilator and put two people on it. Uh, we never had to do that. We had enough ventilators, but you can see that it can be done. Uh, but again, what can't be done is splitting a workforce. So uh, doctors, critical care nurses and social workers, people who really are superb at managing critical care patients and COVID really, these patients are very sick 
they are having blood clots, breathing issues, kidney failure, they have multiple organ failure, they have shock, they are the sickest of the sick. Uh, and so really having critical care folks at the bedside is key. Um, also where they go, whether there are ICU beds available to them or floor beds is another issue too, uh, making sure there are, are enough spots with staff to manage them. We did a lot of telepalliative care, and this is uh, me with one of our nurses and a, a COVID iPad in a Ziploc bag as we're about to take a family in to see their loved one for the first time. And their loved one is on a ventilator, on dialysis, on blood pressure medication. So before we go in the room, we want to explain what they're about to see. And then we can bring them into the room so that they, they know what they're going to see. Because on the right, it's really very scary when they see all of this stuff and the nurses that are wearing all that stuff that look like spacesuits. Um, and it's, it's almost hard to see their loved one and even hard to recognize their loved one sometimes. One of the silver linings uh, in all of this is telemedicine and it's here to stay. And telemedicine and palliative care in particular um, is incredibly useful. And telemedicine has already increased access to palliative care for homebound, frail elderly, people with serious illness, people living in rural areas. And uh, current reimbursement for it has allowed uh, physicians and other providers to do uh, telepalliative care. And so uh, CMS, Medicare, is considering extending this beyond the pandemic. Our own uh, group at ProHealth, uh, we were doing about 10 or so visits a day in our own palliative care group. All of our docs started doing it from zero uh, to three to 5,000 visits per day. So really uh, incredible scale within one to two weeks uh, from zero to 3,000. So uh, patients liked it. Um, it was helpful. It was responsive. Certainly there are certain things you have to see a patient in person for, but it really does allow you to provide caregiver support and meet the needs of seriously ill patients. This is an example of a telepalliative care visit where I'm seeing a patient who's just fallen. She's frail, she's on a blood thinner. Her doctor's voicemail said, go to the ER. Well, that's the last place she wants to go, especially with COVID and she doesn't have COVID. And so she wants to stay home um, and she can have a virtual visit. Um, and we can do a, an assessment now and in four hours and make sure that she's neurologically safe and intact and doing okay. And then follow her up in person um, at a later point but there would be no reason to send someone like this to the ER um, or to a hospital, uh, especially because she doesn't have a way to get there and we could make her a whole lot worse. Some of the other use cases for palliative care, a telepalliative care, telemedicine, besides acute issues and certainly COVID management is a great use case as we follow patients who have COVID and have shortness of breath. Uh, many can be managed at home using telemedicine, uh, managing their pulse oximetry, their breathing, and, and following them closely so we don't have to send everyone to the ER. Um, but we can educate people and we can educate the workforce, nurses. We can uh, have uh, doing an environmental scan. If we're seeing a patient at home, we can have the son or daughter pan the room. We can look at what's in the refrigerator. We can see what somebody might need. We can give caregiver support. Caregivers are often forgotten. And so when we do a telemedicine visit, we can say to the family caregiver, you know, my goodness, your mom looks so well cared for, or who painted her fingernails that beautiful pink color? How, how well cared for does she look? Um, or we might notice that somebody hasn't changed clothes in a couple of days. We've been seeing them every day. And we might ask them, how, how do they do that? Who helps them? And we might start to explore getting additional caregiver support. So it really does, by seeing something, allow us to identify things that are going well and then areas where we might want to uh, offer some guidance. Just going to conclude here with a couple of resources. I've also got my email here. Feel free to email me if there's any questions folks have. But the Center to Advance Palliative Care, American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, and GetPalliativeCare.org. These are some very good palliative care resources. Right now on CAPSI in particular, there are a lot of resources that are in front of the paywall. So you don't have to be a CAPSI member to get resources related to palliative care, uh, and especially those that could be useful during the COVID um, pandemic. So I'm gonna open it up now for questions and some discussion. Um, if you'd like to unmute your mic or type something into the chat, maybe Lillian, you'd help facilitate as well. <laughs> 
course. Thank you so much, Dr. Les Bader. So yes, we'll now open it up to questions. If you have a question, please write it into the Q&A box if you have not already done so. We did receive some questions uh, during your presentation. Will some patients or family members need to advocate for themselves or loved ones to get palliative care when suffering for COVID or another serious illness or disease? It's a great, great question. Um, I'm so glad that uh, somebody asked that. A absolutely. Um, not only do you have to advocate for palliative care without COVID, it's especially important in the setting of COVID, largely because the resources are so limited. Um, and uh, some of the folks that are working in COVID units maybe aren't even normally used to working in the hospital or taking care of sick people. So asking about that, especially if things aren't going well, if things aren't going well, or it looks like uh, a loved one isn't going to survive, uh, maybe they have um, lines and tubes they don't want anymore. Things aren't working as we had hoped. Dialysis isn't working. The ventilator's not working. Um, maybe they have severe underlying illnesses or advanced dementia or poor quality of life to begin with. And certainly now with COVID, things are getting much worse. Um, and asking for palliative care, uh, and that can often even be done virtually. Um, one of the large health systems in New York City uh, got a cadre of virtual palliative care clinicians from around the world. They put out a request for palliative care physicians to please help in a safety net hospital. And in one day, they got 400 volunteers. Um, so, you know, there's this, it was just this tremendous outpouring of people willing to help. But absolutely, you need to advocate for that and ask for that. And you're really entitled to that. So uh, great question. What are the services involved in palliative care and how does it differ um, in an institution versus telemedicine? Yeah, great question. And again, palliative care on the inpatient side in the institutions or hospitals can vary. Most hospitals now, over 80%, have palliative care teams, meaning a doctor, a nurse, or a social worker at least, who can see very sick people. Now, during COVID, sometimes they may be stretched very thin or they might not be going into all the COVID ICUs, for example. So it may have to be done virtually. In the outpatient setting, what we've seen with the palliative care programs that do exist, and there are some, not as many as on the inpatient side, but there are some very good pockets of palliative care, outpatient palliative care programs. Uh, many of those are doing telemedicine. Now ours, for example, converted to 100% telemedicine. We're going back to in-person visits in September, but patients have loved it. They don't have to find parking. Um, some of my patients don't ever want to come back to the office. They they like the punctuality, they like the convenience, they feel it's more intimate. Um, and I will say when it's done well, uh, meaning the clinician has been trained in doing telemedicine, they um, have devoted some time to it, they have a good camera, the lighting is working, it's quiet, the patient can access the technology and has support prior to the visit. It can go very well and it can be even more impactful and better sometimes than an in-person visit because maybe there's less stress in having to get to the doctor's office. Um, one of the questions, and we we get this a lot, is about the difference between palliative care and hospice. Um, can you briefly mention what the difference is in general and also the difference in the context of COVID-19? Yeah, great question. So again, hospice is palliative care and it's, it's palliative care for the end of life. So hospice is a wonderful benefit for people who have terminal illness. So they're dying, they're going to die within six months or less if the disease runs its natural course. Most people who enroll in hospice die within a couple of weeks because we enroll so late, we really should get better at thinking about how do we get patients into hospice sooner because it's a wonderful benefit where doctors, nurses, and social workers provide care mostly at home for people with terminal illness. Palliative care, in contrast to hospice, is for advanced illness, but at any stage of the disease, and people don't have to be dying. So we can deliver palliative care to people who have severe and advanced pain and maybe some dementia. They might have osteoarthritis and a little bit of renal impairment, kidney impairment, and a little dementia, but they're not dying. They're gonna live for three or four or five years, 10 years, but they have a lot of symptoms. They're maybe mostly homebound. Um, I had some patients I saw this morning in telemedicine who are in their 30s and 40s 
with breast cancer who are getting treatment, very symptomatic from the treatment, but they're gonna live and do fine. Uh, one of them just had a baby and she's getting treatment for her breast cancer. She will likely do very well, but I'm helping her through the treatment and she's not terminally ill. So palliative care can be delivered concurrently with other treatments related to the serious or advanced illness and people don't have to be dying. Whereas hospice is for dying people, terminally ill people who are likely to die within six months. Um, and hospice is mostly delivered at home. Sometimes people think it's a place but, but more than 95% of hospice is delivered at home. Um, there are some inpatient hospice beds or facilities, but that's only for patients who cannot be managed at home. Most of the time, we can keep people where they want to be, which is at home. Um, what can healthcare professionals do to advocate for expanded access to palliative care for patients if their institution does not have an existing telepalliative program? So if, if institutions don't have palliative care, first of all, um, certainly advocating to make sure they do it really is a standard and patients and families should demand it. Uh, as I mentioned, 80% or more of hospitals have palliative care capabilities. Um, having telemedicine available, whether it's on the inpatient side or on the outpatient side, um, really isn't very hard and patients like it. And with the flexible reimbursement now that Medicare has allowed during the COVID pandemic, which is likely to continue. CMS Medicare is talking about extending this, which relaxes licensure and site of service. And the payment looks like it might be comparable to an in-person visit. You know, as long as those things are happening uh, and patients like it, um, there's no reason we shouldn't have those things available. The, the reason it was so limited before is you couldn't really get paid for it. Um, and it was pretty restrictive in what sort of um, software or devices you could use. Right now, everything is very relaxed. There may be some restrictions imposed on, on use of certain platforms, but it looks like payment and reimbursement might be comparable to in-person. So um, I think people should recognize the value of it. Patients are going to demand it. There's no turning back, families like it. Um, and it also increases access uh, to homebound seriously ill patients and people living in rural areas or those that, that don't live near a large academic center or a center where there's palliative care capability. They can have a virtual visit and have a very meaningful encounter. You mentioned that uh, some people with COVID-19 have um, ended up having significant illness after the fact. Um, including lung damage. Is palliative care something that, that they can continue to receive or is it time limited? That's a great question. Um, and one of the things in particular relates to the lung injury that we're seeing, really severe lung inflammation and ultimately fibrosis and scarring, much like you would see in end stage COPD actually, uh, but happening over a much shorter time course. And so there are patients that can't come off a ventilator. They have a peg and a trach, a, a breathing tube that's been relocated to the neck so that they can have long-term mechanical ventilation. Or those patients that are lucky enough to come off a ventilator can still have lung scarring and damage. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, at least one patient that I know of that had a lung transplant for end-stage COVID lung disease. Um, other patients have blood clots, uh, thromboembolic disease, blood clots within the lung, uh, which causes other lung damage too. So palliative care is really important for patients who have end-stage COVID lung disease or other uh, real catastrophes from, from this really weird virus. Uh, they might have uh, ongoing suffering. They might have had a stroke. Um, and so palliative care can really be very helpful in pain and symptom management, help for family members caring for somebody. Uh, people who end up with a peg and a trach who go to a long-term care facility um, need a lot of palliative care support because those patients typically don't do well patients who end up on dialysis. We know that patients with renal failure, kidney failure, very often have un untreated symptoms and palliative care clinicians are expert at treating depression, anxiety, uh, and things like that related to kidney failure. So it's a great question and, and many patients experience very severe sequelae from their COVID infection. Who is generally part of a palliative care team? Is it just physicians or are there other um, specialties like social workers? 
Great question. Yeah, it's an interdisciplinary team and generally includes social workers, nurses, doctors, um, home health aides, family caregivers, uh, some community uh, uh, workers, if th those are there, but any and family members, anybody who's part of the patient's uh, orbit, we would like to include. But um, a good team would always have a social worker, at least nurse and a doc. Uh, and that really is the core. And, and very often, a very high functioning team will sort of, uh, you know, uh, be almost interdisciplinary, a transdisciplinary kind of you know, the social worker might say, you know, she just doesn't look quite as good. And I also noticed her legs are kind of swollen on my virtual visit. And then the nurse or doc might jump in or a nurse might say, hey, I'm going to connect you to my social worker because it looks like you really need some extra help at home and should consider privately hiring home health aides. Um, and so there's a lot of just that really good in sync kind of stuff where the team complements each other very well. If you have any questions, feel free to still submit them. We do have some more time. Um, in the meantime, I have a question. So something we're very interested in is providing um, support and raising awareness about um, the healthcare proxy form, which you mentioned. Um, in your experience, did you find that many patients had already completed or were they unfamiliar with the form? Yeah, in fact, most patients had not completed a healthcare proxy form. I didn't even see one, to be honest with you, in caring for hundreds or thousands of patients. Um, they would tell us who their healthcare proxy was, or they would name their surrogate. So we'd always ask them, uh, and we put it in the medical record for everyone because there was such a risk of people uh, having to go on a breathing machine, which would require heavy sedation and sometimes a drug to paralyze them. So we would always want to know who would be making decisions in case they couldn't. Uh, and we would just write that down and that would become their, their healthcare proxy. That was who they appointed. But it was very rare that we'd, we'd have a form. We, we'd sometimes complete the form for them if they were leaving and especially complete the most, the pink New York state form when they were leaving, especially those that were going to a nursing home when their wishes were not to come back to the hospital. So really important for people who want something contrary to the default. If, if patients don't want CPR and to come back to the hospital, they really need a, a, a most form so they're protected from things they don't want because the default is going to be call 911, get CPR, come back to the hospital and have stuff done. If they don't want that, they really need the most form to say, don't hospitalize me and don't put me on a breathing machine. Um, the other boxes don't really have to be checked off because it really is those two things that are so very important on the most form. We uh, received a question. Um, so, uh, oh, we received a few questions. Um, so one of our attendees noted that um, they had not found an organized uh, team uh, in um, their husband when their husband was ill they noted they had to assemble their own team, um, which was a bit of a hit and miss kind of experience where their husband suffered and when physicians did not quite understand what was needed until they um, found some that did. But when it came to hospice, there was a team that was already there. And so they mentioned that, um, I think touching on what you were saying, that palliative care is really interdisciplinary in a team, um, that this is a large gap that palliative care could fill. And I wonder if you could comment on that and also talk a little bit about, um, I guess, palliative care's uh, example and um, how that might benefit patients when perhaps they're not uh, seriously ill, but are experiencing something like perhaps chronic illness. Yeah, that's a great point. And you're right, hospices are superbly um, organized to have an interdisciplinary team with docs, nurses, social workers, um, and they're very responsive. Um, and they're wonderful. And, and finding that same kind of a team outside of hospice can be challenging um, for lots of reasons, partly for payment reasons, uh, that those teams are expensive to put together. But hospice does a really wonderful job. And that is why if somebody has a terminal illness, they really deserve to have hospice care because they will get more stuff. They'll just get more benefit from having uh, uh, enrollment into their hospice benefits. So we're always very eager to enroll patients who have terminal illness into hospice so that they get the care they deserve, especially if they're going to forego other disease-directed treatments. They're no longer getting chemotherapy. They don't want blood transfusions or dialysis. 
uh, if their goals are palliative, they really deserve the care that hospice can provide. Um, and it's, it's a shame that hospice length of stay is so short because we don't have good conversations about hospice earlier on, we meaning physicians in particular, and we're sort of death phobic. And so we don't have these conversations in, a, in an earlier way where families could get more benefit. For patients that are not eligible, though, for hospice, they're still getting other treatments, they're not terminally ill, um, then getting the palliative care team involved, which is a non-hospice, just a, a regular palliative care team, is really important. And having, hopefully, uh, members of the team, like the social worker, nurse, doc, on that team would be ideal. There are places, though, where there isn't going to be a palliative care team, and we continue to have to advocate for that and have public policy that will push for that. We need to train more people so that there are enough palliative care clinicians to meet the need, especially with an aging population and for people who have serious illness. We also need to train up our other workforce. Everybody should have basic palliative care skills. Um, and we do need to train everyone to know the basics about pain and symptom management, effective serious illness communication. We need everyone to step up and know how to care for people with serious illness. And then only for those really hard to manage cases, should those then be referred to our specialty teams. But there aren't enough palliative care clinicians to treat everybody with serious illness. We really need to make sure everybody's got kind of a framework and a basic fund of knowledge of palliative care principles. Thank you. That's, I, I know that um, palliative care, it, there needs to be, there need to be more palliative care providers. So if anyone watching is considering going into that field, I hope that this has given you some food for thought. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. If we did not get a chance to answer your question, or if you think of a question later, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Dr. Lusbader can be contacted at the email on the screen, Dana Lusbader at iCloud.com, or you can contact End of Life Choices at info at endoflifechoicesny.org. We also encourage you to visit our website at endoflifechoicesny.org to learn about our other services, including our services to assist with um, completion of the healthcare proxy form if this is something you do not have. We have several events coming up, including the next installment of our book and film series on August 24th, and more information on that can also be found on our website. Before wrapping up, Dr. Lusbader, do you have any final thoughts or information you'd like to share? Yeah, it's just been a pleasure uh, sharing with you all and meeting with everyone and, um, you know, just would really um, like folks to advocate for their loved ones and folks that you're helping with to make sure pa patients get palliative care and if they're eligible for hospice that we help them get that kind of care that they deserve. Um, and I hope everyone stays safe and healthy. Thank you, Dr. Les Bader. So that concludes our event. Thank you again for taking the time to speak with us today and for raising awareness about palliative care and its ability to improve quality of life for everyone, including patients battling COVID-19. And thank you to everyone watching for sharing your time with us today. I hope you will join us again at an upcoming event. Take care and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye, thank you.